Physics engines are responsible for figuring out where each object in a scene is over time. Objects can collide with one another, then choose to respond in several ways. It's a generic problem that the user can configure at several different levels. Do they want a collider? Do they want to respond to collisions? Do they want to simulate dynamics? They could want dynamics, but not gravity. It's a problem that calls for good planning and robust design. The problem can be split into two or three pieces. Dynamics, collision detection, and collision response. I'll start with dynamics because it's by far the simplest. Dynamics is all about calculating where the new positions of objects are based on their velocity and acceleration. In high school, you'll learn about the four kinematic equations along with Newton's three laws, which describe the motion of objects. We'll only be using the first and third kinematic equations. The others are more useful for analysis of situations, not simulation. That leaves us with these two equations. We can give ourselves more control by using Newton's second law, subbing out acceleration, leaving us with this formula for the velocity. We'll use this struct to store the object info for now. We need a way to keep track of the objects we want to update. A classic approach is to have a physics world with a list of objects and a step function that loops over each one. Note the use of pointers. This forces other systems to take care of the actual storing of objects, leaving the physics engine to worry about physics, not memory allocation. With this, you can simulate all sorts of stuff, from objects flying through the sky to solar systems. You can do a lot with this, but it's the easy part to be honest, and that's not what you came for. Collision detection is more involved, but we can lighten the load by using some clever tricks. Let's think about what needs to be found first. If we look at some examples of objects colliding, we notice that in most cases there is a point on each shape that is furthest inside the other. This turns out to be all we need to respond to a collision. From those two points we can find the normal and how deep the objects are inside one another. This is huge because it means that we can abstract the idea of different shapes away and only worry about the points in their response. Let's jump into the code. We'll need some helper structs to store the points of the collision and the location of both objects. Each shape will have a different type of collider to hold its properties and a base to allow them to be stored. Any type of collider should be able to test for a collision with any other type, so we'll add functions in the base for each one. These functions will take transforms so the colliders can use relative coordinates. I'll only demonstrate spheres and planes, but the code is repeatable for any number of shapes. Let's make both types of colliders at the same time so we can see how they interact. A sphere is defined as a point and a radius, and a plane is defined as a vector and a distance. We'll override the functions from Collider, but won't worry about the work for now. In cases like this, where there are many classes with a web of similar functions, it can be confusing as to where the actual code is located. Sphere vs Sphere would obviously be in the sphere.cpp file, but Sphere v Plane could either be in sphere.cpp or plane.cpp. There's no way to know without hunting, which gets annoying when there are many files. To get around this, let's make an algo namespace and put the actual work in there. We'll need a function for each pair of colliders we want to be able to check. I've made a sphere v sphere, sphere v plane, but not plane v plane because it's not so useful. I'm not going to cover these functions here because they're not part of the design per se, but you can check out the source if you're interested. We can choose per collider which other colliders it will detect by filling or not filling in these functions. In this case, we don't want plane v plane collisions, so we return to empty collision points. We can add a function for testing the base and use a technique called double dispatch. This takes advantage of the type system to determine both types of colliders for us by swapping the arguments, determining the first, then the second type through two calls of test collision. This saves us from needing to know what type of colliders we are checking, which means we've fully abstracted away the notion of different shapes outside the collision detection. You can use these colliders on their own, but most likely want to attach one to an object. We are still only using position in the dynamics, but can use scale and rotation in the collision detection. A good design practice is to separate all the different aspects of complex functions like step into their own. This makes the code much more readable, so let's add another function named resolve collisions in the physics world. First we'll need another helper struct to store the points and the objects involved. This is looking good. Because of that double dispatch, there's no need for anything other than a single call to test collisions. Using a break in the for loop gives us the unique pairs so we never check the same objects twice. Now that we have detected a collision, we need some way to react to it. Because we have abstracted away the idea of different shapes into points, the collision response is almost pure math. The design is relatively simple compared to what we just went through. We'll start with the idea of a solver. The solver is used to solve things about the physics world. That could be impulse from a collision or raw position correction. Really anything you choose to implement. We'll need another list in the physics world to store these, and a function to add and remove them. After we generate our list of collisions, we can feed it to each solver. In the last section, the meat was in the design. This one leans much more towards what kind of solvers you implement. I've made an impulse and position solver myself that seem to work for most situations. 
To keep this short, I won't cover the math here, but you can check out the source for the impulse solver and the position solver in the description if you're interested. Let's see a demo. The real power of a physics engine comes from the options that you give to the user. In this example, there aren't too many that can be changed, but we can start to think about the different options we want to add. In most games, you want a mix of objects, some that simulate dynamics and others that are static obstacles. There's also a need for triggers, objects that don't go through the collision response, but fire off events for exterior systems to react to, like an end of level flag. Let's go through some minor edits we can make to allow these settings to be easily configured. The biggest change we can make is to distinguish between objects that simulate dynamics and ones that don't. Because of how many more settings a dynamic object needs, let's separate those out from what is necessary for collision detection. We can split objects into collision object and rigid body structs. We'll make rigid body inherit from collision objects to reuse the collider properties and allow us to store both types easily. We are left with these two structs. A dynamic cast could be used to figure out if a collision object is really a rigid body, but we'll make the code slightly longer, so I like to add a boolean flag even though it's not considered best practice. We can also add a flag for the object to act as a trigger and a function for a callback. While we're at it, let's beef up the security by protecting the raw values through getters and setters. We can add many more settings to the rigid body. It's useful if each object has its own gravity, friction, and bounciness. This opens the door to all sorts of physics-based effects. In a game you could have an ability that changes the gravity in an area for a time, you could have some objects be bouncy and others like weight balls. A floor could be made out of ice and be slippy for a harder challenge. Let's split the physics world into a collision world and dynamics world as well. We can move the step function into the dynamics world and resolve collisions into the collision world. This saves someone who doesn't want dynamics from sifting through functions that are useless to them. We can make some edits to the resolve collision functions to give triggers their correct functionality. Let's split the function into its parts to keep it readable. Adding a callback to the world can be useful too if you want program-wide events. To keep the step function readable, let's split it up into pieces as well. Now we have a whole stack of options that the user can configure for many different scenarios with a simple yet powerful API. I hope you can use the principles from this video to get a better idea of how to lay out complex systems in nimble ways, or even make your own engine. There's a lot more to cover, but I'll leave that to a part 2 because this is getting long. Let me know what you thought, should I keep focusing on the design or dive deeper into the math behind the implementations? Thanks for watching, I hope to catch you next time.